Hello and welcome to Global Business Africa, CCTV's new program with insights into Africa's ever-changing business landscape. From Nairobi to Johannesburg, from Lagos to Cairo, from small businesses to large entrepreneurs, we take you directly to the entrepreneurs making the headlines. I'm G2 Abraham here in the Kenyan capital of Nairobi where it's 9 p.m. It's 2 p.m. in Washington, D.C. and 2 a.m. in Beijing. Wherever you're joining us from, welcome. Pressure mounts on South Africa's third largest employer as Noomsa's industrial action enters its third day. And U.S. government regulations on money transfers threatens the lifeline of millions of Somalians. And a chat with an investment banker who swapped the corporate world for the beauty industry. Let's begin in South Africa, where the strike by members of the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa entered its third day on Thursday. As results, the strain on the manufacturing sector continues. The latest purchasing managers index has again come in below 50 points, showing a contraction in the manufacturing activity. Now, the industry is the third largest employer in South Africa and forms an essential part of the government's national development plan. But ongoing strike action is keeping the sector under pressure. CCTV Sumitra Naidu now reports. The latest Purchasing Managers Index showed a slight improvement in manufacturing activity, but the sector is still underperforming. The PMI for July came in at 46.6 points. Anything below 50 points indicates a contraction in the industry. Last month, the PMI fell to its lowest level in three years. Last week, the five-month-long platinum strike finally came to an end. The strike cost the country billions of dollars, as a result, first quarter GDP came in negative, raising fears of a recession. Even though the strike has ended, the full impact is still to be felt. Platinum strikes playing a huge role. Um, if you look at the manufacturing sector and its uh, links into the, the or into the mining sector, um, it definitely plays, plays quite a big role. Um, you know, a lot of suppliers supply into the mining sector and again they've got suppliers supplying into their, fac uh, into their operations, in, into their factories. Now the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa is on strike. Over 200,000 workers are striking until they get a 12% wage hike. South Africa's manufacturing sector is declining, while other countries like the US, China and Europe are all showing a steady recovery. Europe zone and Europe is starting to come out of a recession. So that is supposed to actually help the South African economy and also this manufacturing sector. But um, although they are uh, growing and improving, uh, we don't see this, this feeding through into our manufacturing sector. This is a local box factory just outside Johannesburg. As you can see behind me, there's very little going on here today because many of the workers have joined the NUMSA strike. Economists are warning that if this loss of productivity continues, there will be some serious job losses in the manufacturing sector. But government foresees a turnaround. We would have been in a much worse situation if we hadn't had the Industrial Policy Action Plan. I'm absolutely convinced of that. I think we would have been sitting around and discussing uh, serious deindustrialization of what's happening. Demand for manufactured goods, both locally and internationally, have dropped. Export numbers have fallen and the country's trade deficit now sits at $4.1 billion. As a result, South African exporters have also not been able to capitalize on a weaker currency. The weak grand environment uh, is a lot of people actually thought that it will help this sector, but you know we've seen a weak grand environment for quite a while now, and we're not seeing any any um, you know better numbers coming through in the manufacturing sector. Rising inflation has become an added negative. The Reserve Bank is likely to hike rates at its next meeting later this month. This will add further strain to the manufacturing sector. While government has tried to boost the industry through incentive programs and increased investment, there's been little improvement. Sumitra Nadu, CCTV, Johannesburg.
East African presidents of Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda were joined by their counterparts from Ethiopia and South Sudan at the sixth annual Northern Corridor Integration Project Summit being held in Kigali, Rwanda. Now, the meetings regularly assess progress towards economic integration of the East African community region and work to enhance trade ties. South Sudan hailed the move to accelerate its path to join the community, while Ethiopia, which attended in observant capacity, challenged the region to seek self-sustaining strategies in energy and production of goods and services. We have taken integration from merely being a dream of our people to actually a reality. And a lot of our people are benefiting from this, and I believe it is also opening up a great deal of potential that our region has. I only wish to take this opportunity to thank my fellow heads of state, because from our very first meeting in Kampala, we have never failed to meet as agreed every two months to update progress. And I think this has also motivated our ministers, our senior officials, to also do and to play their part. I personally am convinced that if we continue along this path, integration and ultimately federation will no longer be a dream, but will be a reality in our lifetimes. I want to take this opportunity also to say that I'm very happy to see our brothers from Ethiopia joining us and I believe this is the kind of spirit that we want to move towards to see deeper integration and more intra-Africa trade. And this is a very good beginning and an example, I think, that can be copied by many others. The Egyptian government is planning to increase fuel prices soon. This is in order to fund a huge energy subsidy in the country. Now, the looming increment has not sat well with consumers who rush to stock up on the commodity. Sources close to the matter say that the government may enforce the hike towards the end of July. CCTV's Yasser Hakim takes a closer look at the reactions to this decision. As Egyptians were looking forward to celebrate the June uprising's first anniversary, Instead, they received the news of an imminent price increase in fuel and diesel. The government was planning to implement a smart card system at the end of the year, which allows access to subsidized fuel only to the poor and needy, who account to over 50% of the population. Instead, the smart cards were discarded completely, and fuel price increase will affect all, rich and poor. The smart cards will take a year to implement, and the government doesn't have the luxury of time. It has to reduce subsidies on energy by 40% this year to contain the huge budget deficit. The country cannot depend on loans and aid from the Gulf forever. Officials say overall prices should increase by 5 to 7%. The problem is controlling unnecessary inflationary rise in the market, especially in food and transportation. The prices of public transportation will remain the same, but there's also the small buses called microbus, just like the ones here. Now they're popular and they raised their tickets by 50% last week because of a rumor in a rise of fuel and petrol prices the next day. Even though it turned out to be just a rumor, they kept the new price as it is and Egyptians had no choice, they had to pay. The Micropus drivers blame the government and petrol stations. When the rumor spread, many stations hid their fuel. We had to buy it from the black market. That's why we raised the fare. It's not our fault. The government must stop smuggling. The government says it has the tools to prevent traders from abusing the situation. But are Egyptians convinced? The government will fail to control traders, and we will be the ones who will pay the price. The country needs to take such steps, we understand, but the real burden will be on the poor. The rich can afford these new prices. The Prime Minister confirmed that revenue expected at $1 billion will be spent on developing shanty towns and health services for the poor. Yasser Hakim for CCTV, Cairo. Let's take a look now at the markets that we track here for you to see how they close the day. Nairobi Securities Exchange said it will sell 31% of its own shareholdings in the bourse after receiving regulatory approval. Now the exchange is aiming to complete the sale during the second half of this year.
Still ahead on global business, the U.S. government's regulations on money transfers threatens the lives of millions of Somalians. The details and reactions to these changes are ahead. Africa is on the move. It's home to seven of the world's ten fastest growing economies. From small businesses to large-scale enterprises, you're directly from entrepreneurs behind the story. It's about putting you in the picture so you know where Africa fits in the global context. Global Business, weekdays at this time on CCTV Africa. We do know that the strike isn't anywhere near close to coming to an end either. That means that those workers are going to sink even further into poverty. Welcome back, you're watching Global Business. Now, U.S. financial laws designed to stop illicit money transfers may end up empowering criminals and extremists in Somalia. Now, that's the conclusion reached by some Somalian Americans seeking to send money back legally to their families through traditional services called hawalas. In tonight's What's Hot segment, we focus on remittances, which are a lifeline for many Somalians, but which could soon be a thing of the past. From Washington, Daniel Renches starts us off with this report. A handful of Somali Americans have in recent years been recruited and trained by the radical group Al-Shabaab. That's led to concerns from banks here that they risk breaking U.S. laws designed to prevent illicit money transfers to extremists and criminals. At least 40 percent of Somalis rely on money legitimately sent from abroad. I would say the vast majority of families, including mine, that are in Somalia, in country, and actually also in Kenya as well, um, rely on these monies that are being sent over. It is, it is essentially a lifeline because you have to remember there is no government, so there is no essential services. To receive money from the U.S., they rely on a traditional service called a hawala. But U.S. and other international banks are denying hawala's services to wire money internationally. Somali-American Gulad Kasim says the system will increasingly rely on whoever is willing to physically bring in large foreign cash supplies. You're making money and you're taking risks. Um, so it's going to be, you know, the whatever is efficient um, and whatever is available. So that's where, you know, you could have bad actors come in uh, and really either play a monopoly, ro monopolistic role uh, or be, you know, sort of be empowered. Um, that now they have the control of, of the flow of the money, literally. The shutdown of money transfer services impacts aid agencies as well. The UN says that up to 200,000 children under the age of five could die from severe malnutrition in Somalia by the end of the year unless the UN can raise and distribute emergency aid into the country. But a recent report estimated that Somali families are sending 1.3 billion US dollars each year into the country. That's a much higher figure than the total of humanitarian aid flowing there. Daniel Renches, CCTV, Washington. Daniel Renches joins us now live from Washington, D.C. for more analysis on this, along with Mohamed Hermoga, who joins us live from Mogadishu. Daniel, if we can start with you, there is fear that closing these money service businesses could exacerbate the risk of money laundering, ultimately pushing expatriates towards illegal channels of sending money. Now, these channels are even harder to control and would do even more to encourage criminal activity. And as you said in your piece, relying on whoever is able to physically bring in large foreign cash supplies. Now, has Washington addressed this drawback? Well, I think Washington, the U.S. Treasury in particular, recognizes the value of these hawalas in terms of humanitarian aid, in terms of remittances to families, and in terms of also legitimate business activity. But at the same time, it's true that most of them have traditionally been reliant on informal networks in which no formal documentation is really put into the system. And that's the problem, because it then gives an opportunity for people who want to fund terrorist activities or criminal activities or even sanctions evaders the opportunity to get in there. So there was a system put in place which was licensing of these organizations, which would oblige them then to track and monitor 
the origin of these funds, make it clear what was going on. Uh, clearly that is working in some cases, but not in others. The US Treasury says there are still avenues for Somalis to legitimately use these services to get through. But there is a question mark, as, as I was saying in that report, about how much the banks are willing to continue to work with them. Mohammed, if we can go to you, uh, charges for sending money to Africa are already well above 7.8 percent. And with many traditional banking systems now closing their money transfer accounts, we could see these costs continue to rise. Now, how are people there reacting to this? That's right, Jitu. The charges are 7.8 percent, quite high and even rising. And with the Hawala money transfer systems coming under close scrutiny by either Barclays or, or uh, in banks of the United States uh, because of what they're saying, tightening the news on either terror funding or money laundering activities. Uh, either way you look at it, the people here back here suffer because the much they can get from their kin. I mean, large percentage of the people here receive less than $100 per month. And when that is the case and charges are rising, and even as these hawalas close, only a few will be left to survive because of tougher compliance rates. Uh, we understand Barclays had had an interim agreement with the hub shield sometime about two months ago and the hub shield is at the moment looking for alternative banks which not sure it might get and that might lead to many hawalas closing in the uk and with these ambiguous uh, compliance rules in the us it may weigh heavily on people back here because the family that was receiving less than hundred dollars with these charges rising 7.8 percent now and even going up I mean, uh, are people here saying that that will affect uh, their running because people here don't have, I mean, the large percentage of people here rely on these uh, remittances from Kenya abroad uh, for food, shelter, education, and medicine. And they're saying what they will get and at the end of the day might not be enough to serve them well. Daniel, to you, U.S. regulators are not banning banks from doing business with money transfer companies. They are, though, requiring them to have adequate compliance programs. The banks are complaining that the term is unclear. Now, what are banks saying on your end about this? I don't think the terms are unclear in terms of what the bank's obligations are. The bank is obliged to know where the money's come from. And if you have a hawala in the middle, you don't know where that money's come from unless the Hawala gives you accurate information. So the banks are pretty much saying, I think, well, we can't rely on what the Hawalas are telling us, um, and it costs too much for us to do that. There are regulations for the Hawalas, but clearly the banks are saying it's simply not enough for us to be assured that we are complying with US law in terms of the, of the rules which require us to know where this money is coming from. And with so many issues in Somali related to security, criminal and terrorist activity, that's why the banks are now ebbing, edging away from this situation. And that's why I think there is now pressure on the US government to try to increase the sort of formalization of this sector, as well as the Hawalas themselves, which will need to be somewhat more formal, like the Western unions, maybe smaller, in order to continue to operate within US laws and to satisfy the banks that they can work with them. Mohammed, to you, uh, we've heard the worry that from family members abroad that if these services are limited or if they're closed, that their young family members might be more susceptible to being recruited by militant groups who have cash on hand to pay new members. Now, what are you hearing on this? Should this be a legitimate concern? Well, indeed, yes. Uh, that's a legitimate concern because in Africa we have seen uh, that, that poverty is one of the underlying causes of civil strife and subsequently militia groups recruiting young men because what is the option they don't have like, they don't attend classes and they don't have jobs and the only option left for them is to fend for their families both here and also uh, not in the cities alone but also in the villages in the outpost and they have to feed these families and when they get uh, the militia groups could woo these guys. I mean, if they're able to offer $100 minus any charges, that would be enough for the young people. Uh, it would be a good offer for them to take. Therefore, the concern is there indeed. Plus, one other concern that's really here is if this hawala stop, many also believe that the business could go underground and operate illegally. Either way, it's not good for the young men, unless say. All right, thank you for that. That's uh, Daniel Wrench is joining us live from Washington, D.C., and Hermog uh, Mohammed Hermoga joining us live from Mogadishu. Now we take a look at the commodity prices for the day.
Brent futures dipped below $111 a barrel on Thursday as supply fears were eased after Libya declared an end to the oil crisis that has cut exports from the OPEC member to a trickle. Now, although deadlines are expected to be capped by concerns over Iraq. And when we come back, a chat with an investment banker who swapped the corporate world for the beauty industry. Welcome back. You're watching Global Business. Now, let's take a look at other news making the headlines in African presses. The Daily Guide in Ghana is reporting on the unmet demand of some 35,000 tons of palm oil. The newspaper is quoting the outgoing Minister of State in charge of finance and allied institutions, Fifi Kowete, as saying that the country only produced this term about 244,000 tons of palm oil. The minister stressed the need for the government to put adequate measures in place to meet the deficit. From West Africa to Algeria in the north, the EcoRook is celebrating the government for setting up mercy markets during the holy month of Ramadan. The newspaper says the markets set up by the Ministry of Commerce and Trade have been a great attraction. Goods, which include food items and textiles, are trading cheaper by about 25 percent when compared to other markets. And finally, in Tanzania, the Daily News is reporting about the central bank's defense of its monetary policy. The newspaper quotes one bank's economist as saying that the policy is aimed at averting a situation where the country experiences runaway inflation and that it does not affect the flow of investment into the country. African women are being recognized more and more for their entrepreneurial accomplishments. In South Africa, Frieden Isengoma opened the first eyebrow threading salon in Cape Town in 2009. Tonight in our grassroots segment, Julie Shire speaks to Isengoma about her expanding threading and lashing bar business in South Africa. Frida Isingoma is a businesswoman who came from London five years ago to work as an investment banker in South Africa. Born in England to Ugandan parents, Frida quickly realized how much entrepreneurship opportunities South Africa had to offer. After 11 years of investment banking and corporate world, Frida Isingoma ventured into a new industry that resulted in the birth of eye candy and introduced threading to South Africa. I focus on venture capitalism in London, so I'd always um, invested in and given time to small companies. So there was a part of me that was always fascinated with running my own business as I met lots and lots of entrepreneurs who inspired me. So when I decided that I wanted to leave investment banking, I knew the next step would be then to run my own business. And at the time I saw a gap in the market, in beauty market in South Africa. Um, so I did my research and did a trial and saw that there was an actual need for, for the service, so then I launched the company. Starting up a business is never an easy task, and Frida has had her fair share of challenges. It's setting up eye candy in a new country um, that has a different culture um, was quite difficult. So um, there have been extreme challenges along the way, I think, that come with setting up your own business and working for yourself. As a foreigner, you can't apply for funding in this country, so everything came from my savings. Eye candy already has three threading and lash bars in Johannesburg apart from the standalone in Cape Town. In four years, iCandy's ancient technique of eyebrow threading has attracted many clients. I think it's fantastic because, I mean, it's, it's easy to do, it's convenient, and, um, you know, the effect is really what you're looking for. Yes, I liked it. It was my first time doing it. I was, I'm so impressed. I would definitely come back to iCandy. It was fast. It was just an easy process. No pain, no nothing. 
Business is going well for Frida is in Goma. So the focus is in expanding the business. So we're focused on grooming, so we do threading. We also do eyelash extensions and lash perming. And we're introducing more nails at the standalone. Um, introduce eye candy to all its flagship stores. So that's the, that's the rollout plan for the future. Eye candy was a great entrepreneur bet, but Frida's drive and vision is what made it possible, especially in a foreign country. I would say if you're venturing into something, you have to be passionate about it. And I'd also say never give up. I think a lot of business people, particularly women, give up too easily. If you remain passionate, just keep carrying on. I think South Africa is a country that's ripe with opportunities. I also feel it's a country that encourages entrepreneurship as well. So as long as with the, the combination of the two, it's, it's a great place to start a business. I feel South Africa has offered, uh, offered me an opportunity to open eye candy. I'm not sure whether I would have had the same opportun opportunities anywhere else. So far, Frida's business acumen has put her on the road to success. Julie Shire, CCTV, Johannesburg. A quick look at how your money is trading today. The rand fell to a near two-week low against the dollar as a two-day-old strike by South Africa's engineering and metal workers took its toll on an already fragile investor sentiment. Just before we go, here's what's coming up on Global Business tomorrow. We examine Ghana's troubled economy with inflation running well above the government's target of around 9% as the CD comes in over 50% weaker against the U.S. dollar in the last year alone. What are the government's opinions on the situation? That's it for this edition of Global Business. Remember, you can send us your feedback to globalbusinessafrica at cctv.com. You can visit our Facebook page, CCTV Africa. You can also stay in touch with Global Business on Twitter using the handle at CCTV News Africa. I'm G2 Abraham. Thanks for watching.